What's up, y'all? Your boy Hijack and Mike here at Ohlone Cigar Lounge for the man, the myth, the legend, Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust man, Steve Saka, here for our event today from 4 to 8 p.m. You know what's so disturbing about that word legend? What's that? Because when I think about when I got into cigars and I think about the people that I call a legend, okay, they're all fucking dead. Gotcha. So once someone starts calling you legend, I'm like 20, I'm like, I'm like 20 years countdown at best. So we'll say superstar. Eh, I don't know if that's any better. That gets a little weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got the man himself here for our event at Ohlone. Come down and join us four to eight. Even if you miss the event, we will have plenty of Sockas, Dumbarton Trust, or Tom Dumbarton Tobacco and Trust. It is a mouthful, isn't it? Yeah, it is. That it shit is. does not fit on a t-shirt either. <laughs> well, we I don't try. know what I was thinking. <laughs> we can try. <laughs> So how are you, man? Good, man. How's your trip to the Bay Area so far? Oh, no, that sucks. Let's not talk about that. Come gotcha, on. Gotcha, yeah, gotcha. Come on. All right, my man. We were victim of a smashing grab. We lost all uh, our crap. So. We don't want to dredge that up now. I'm, I hear you. Just starting to get a little, all right. a little better here. Well, cigars. Yeah. How long have you been a cigar smoker? Uh, well, first cigar would have been down the river, by the river, with some friends. Splitting a six pack of Lone Star, so I think they were like Swisher Sweet. So I was like at the age of like 14. Um, but actually, like real cigars, I started smoking real cigars when I was enlisted in the Navy. Okay. So I was right around the age of like not quite 19. Okay. Yeah, so that's when I started. So that's been, I'm 59 now, so that's 40 odd years. That's why I measure it in yeah, the bar. 40 odd years I've been smoking cigars. Okay. All right. What day or when in time did you realize, you know what, I want to get into cigars. I want to make a cigar. I want to create a cigar. Uh, I want to work it didn't work industry. that way. It didn't work that way? No, not at all. Fell it in was, your hands. Yeah, I just, just got really cigar crazy and I started doing, uh, started doing events for my friends and they just kind of grew. It started off as a little thing where I take some friends to uh, Little Havana and then we go to Cuba, and then we did this thing called Boondoggle in Vegas, and we and that grew to be like 300 plus people. And okay. I never had really any intention of really actually getting into the cigar business. I was writing about cigars on the internet back before anybody else was, and uh, my first job actually in the cigar business was from Lou Rothman at JR Cigar, and I didn't really even have any intention of getting a job. But he's the one that proposed the idea to me, and he, uh, love you, Lou. You grossly overpaid me. Thank you. And, uh, and that's kind of the way it started. Okay. So I was really, I was really blessed because you know, most people work their way from the bottom up. Yes. And I got to work my way from the top down. I'm still, still going down since that time. I mean, so, yeah, it was good. Okay. Yeah. Well, look, Lou, half a billion dollar a year company. You know, uh, at the time, the number one seller of cigars in America at the time made money on like 70% of every cigar smoked in America. Yeah. So, I mean, it was a really, it was a really great, it was really good for me because I was, we were into cigars and tobacco and the whole geek part, but I really didn't know anything so much about the cigar business. Okay. So here I am, my very first job is working for the guy who is the literally the 800 pound gorilla of the cigar business. So it was a, incredibly educational experience for me um, that honestly uh, very 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 few people have that kind of opportunity so it's really, I, in hindsight not that I'm gonna send you a check Lou but uh, he, I should have paid him I really should have it was, gotcha. yeah it was a gotcha. yeah it was a, it was an eye-opening experience okay so when it comes to a Steve Saka original blend of cigar what does it take for Steve Saka to find the perfect blend before you get it on the shelf to the consumer? It depends. Look, some things go together relatively quickly, okay. and other things take way too long. Krakatoa took like over three years. Um, a lot of the long lead times are mostly from the point that you're going with test materials that you've bought in small quantities, and you're saying, okay, I want to make something with this, but you then need to secure enough material. Yeah. So oftentimes it is somewhere around a, a two plus year window from the point that you're like okay this is going to be the blend this is what i'm going to do this is where we're going before it actually becomes a product that goes into the bottles so and look, and look i mean it's really weird because 
we have a lot of cigars that are very diverse. Okay. You know, you got brulee that's really mild and blonde. We got really, you got really heavy cigars like Tricky Traca that are spicier. Gotcha. You got red, red meat lovers. It's kind of like yeah. medium plus plushes, right? So there's a lot of different flavor profiles and a lot of different strength profiles. It doesn't even count the weird stuff like Stillwell or anything like that. But the one universal thing that holds true throughout the entire brand is they're all blends that I like. They're all blends that I made just for me to like because we don't focus group anything. Nobody gets an opinion. And they all tend to be made out of really top flight materials. Okay. And I don't tend to like anything that's really super bitey or sharp. I like, even when it's a strong cigar, I still want it to be smooth. Yeah. You know what I mean? So even our strongest cigars, they're still smooth cigars, you know? So that's kind of a general theme that you're going to find throughout everything, whether it be our mildest cigars or our very strongest cigars. Almost all of them are pretty damn smooth. A couple little exceptions. I don't think Popetta is smooth. It's a little bit rougher. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, Broad's back, which we released this year because of the 2LS wrapper, that's got a little bit more bite. Um, some of the smaller sizes of Tricky Traca, like the 448, okay. that could be a little bit of a little bit of a chili pepper. But as a general rule of thumb, even then, I think these cigars I'm naming, I think there's plenty of cigars in the marketplace that are sharper and more biting. You know, because again, yeah. for me, smooth is always important because. I don't, I don't enjoy cigars that punish me. Okay, yeah. And you don't want a pepper bomb. Yeah, and... look, I do every once in a while, but yeah. that's the point. It's every once in a while I want a pepper bomb. And, yeah. and look, my experience is that most consumers, as they go through their cigar journey and they really get into cigars, they keep escalating the level of strength, right? Yeah. And they keep wanting stronger, stronger, craving stronger, stronger. And eventually you hit a point where you can't get any stronger, yeah. right? It's just like, there's no way to make it stronger. Exactly. And Normally, after about three, four years, they kind of dial it back a little. Okay. Because the problem when you get to that level of sharpness, you lose so much of the flavor. You can't you can't enjoy the tobacco as much when all you're doing is smoking just for the strength level. Yes. So most of my cigars are kind of made for that person that's kind of gone through the journey and then has kind of backed off a little bit. That's why we always say that, you know, our best customers are the ones that are the most discerning, the most experienced. And you find a lot of people, if you talk to the people that smoke a lot of Dunbarton, a lot of them, I mean, recently there's new consumers, yeah. but for probably the first seven years of the company, it's almost people that have really smoked an awful lot of cigars. They've tried a lot of different things. They've smoked a lot of different brands, some really bad ones and some really good ones and a lot of in the middle. But the more experienced a consumer is, the more likely they are to actually become a hardcore Dunbarton person okay. because they've had enough experience that they can recognize the difference in the product, you know, so that, that helps to us. But yeah, okay. so general rule of thumb, it has, it has to, even when full body, it still has to be smooth. Gotcha. Okay. A couple more questions for you yeah. before we wrap. What is it you look for when you create a cigar? Is there a specific flavor, like a set of strength, pepper, no. smooth, when, you, when you're trying so to make a certain thing? you name? basically have... So there's like three ways new cigars get made. The first way is you have a particular tobacco that you somehow want to either use because you have to, yeah. or you want a feature. The second way is you have kind of a general flavor profile strength in mind, and you want to create a cigar to fit that flavor profile, that strength that you have in mind. And then the third way, which has regretfully become the most popular way, is the marketing weenies in the United States say to you, hey, such and such is doing really, really well. We don't have anything like that. So we want you to make something that kind of like is like this. And then the marketing guys really kind of drive the products. Um, we don't tend to do that because we don't have any marketing weeds. Well, actually we do, it's me, I'm the marketing weed. Um, and so for us, it's always because there's a particular material or like in the case of like brulee, yeah. we didn't have anything for the mild shade kind of smoker. So that's an area where, okay, we need to make a cigar that's gonna satisfy that particular type of desire need, you know, but, uh, but yeah, almost always. I mean, and now at this point, other than the fact that we don't have a, like an Uber pepper bomb, there really isn't much missing from the portfolio. I think that there's probably something in the mix for 
probably a good 90 plus percent of the consumers. Okay. You know, I mean, there's certain areas we don't have a, we don't have any Sumatran, uh, but we will next year. We're going to introduce our very first Sumatran. All right, so, sounds good. So there'll be something there for those folks, but uh, we don't have any Cameroon. I don't think we'll ever do any Cameroon because it's just too difficult material to source consistently in the quality that you want. Yeah. So I don't, I don't like to get into materials that uh, I ultimately can't secure enough to make the product consistent. Gotcha. So like if I get a Cameroon, it would probably be like some sort of like one-off small batch, limited exclusive. You're only worried about making 5,000, 10,000 cigars. But I, I don't like to start a brand if I can't literally make hundreds of thousands and hopefully millions of cigars over the course of the years that will be consistent because when you look at all the really great brands, the one thing, regardless of whether you like the flavor or don't like the flavor, they're consistent. Okay. The consumer that buys Padron knows what they're getting. The person who buys Dalvin knows what they're getting. The person that buys uh, Fuente Don Carlos, they know what they're getting. Yes. And you can only achieve that if you have a good steady supply of materials locked in so that you can make the blend really consistently. Because if you're making something, you know, from limited materials, it, you can't make it the same True. on the ongoing basis. So for me, I don't like to get into projects that I that I know are going to be a problem. Exactly. We're going to run into problems. Oh, yeah. yeah like we stopped making Todos Las Dias because I couldn't secure enough of a particular leaf to make the blend. Continue the blend. To keep okay. So it was either have to change the blend or stop making the blend because I had to stop making the blend. Yeah. Yeah. We do it in limited batches as I have enough leaf to go, but I don't like running into that problem. Yeah, I, I like I try to make things that I feel as though we can make consistently good, great, the way it's supposed to be. Let's yeah. say the way it's supposed to be. Gotcha. Okay, the way it's supposed to be for long term. Yeah. And look, uh, some days you just plan on certain things and things get beyond your control. But I don't like going into a project knowing that I'm like this is a problem. Yeah. Because you don't want to run out of a certain leaf, correct? Because if you have yeah. to change the flavor that you intended the cigar yeah, to because here's in. the thing. So you, you make a cigar, and let's say you get 100 people to try it. You're not going to get 100 people to like it. You're not even going to get 30 people to like it. Okay. What you're really hoping is you get just one or two people out of the 100 that try to go, wow, that was really good, and they add it to their rotation. Okay. So they add it to their rotation. They buy it on a regular when they walk in a store. They like it enough that they buy a whole box. And then when the box gets low, they get down to the last three or four, they're like, man, I got to buy another box of those, right? Yeah. So those consumers end up knowing exactly what the blend tastes like. They end up knowing exactly what the blend smokes like. So you really owe it to them yeah. to try to make it as consistent as possible. Because as soon as they buy it and it isn't the same, they go, oh, they screwed up my cigar. They changed, right? the, blend. They changed yeah. the blend. They did this. They did that. And look, we all know as cigar consumers, how many cigars have you smoked that were newly released you absolutely love them in the first year for them to just like go totally wayward within just a few months sometimes yeah. after introduction and exactly. I mean, so it's for me because you don't get the other the other people that try it the 100 people the 98 that tries it, oh, it wasn't for me they don't come back and retry the new one yeah the different one they've moved on because they got hundreds of other choices so you really have to be very particular about maintaining that consistency of flavor and quality to keep the customer who does like it happy with the product. Gotcha. Okay. With your career in the industry, what do you feel for the big following you have that you've gained over the years? Because you started off with, I believe it was the Drew Estate? Uh, before that, JR. JR? Okay. Uh, then Drew Estate. Yeah, but I wasn't really the face of either of those companies. But you did I make some good behind. cigars. Yeah, of course. Yeah, no. I mean, look, the goal is always to make good cigars, right? Definitely, definitely. I mean, the whole concept of making sucky cigars seems foreign to me, so. Ah, we don't want that. But uh, why? I don't know. That's a that's a better question to ask consumers. Okay. I mean, I'd like to think that they like the product first, right? They follow you because they used, they're used to your brand, your yeah, blend. But, but, but I hope they're not following me because of me. I hope that me is the thing that they tolerate because the product is good. Yes. You know what I mean? Because exactly. what you really want is you want them to like the product more than like me. Because first off, I'm not that likable, number one. <laughs> number two, 
uh, that's a very fickle thing. You have to continually dance like a chimpanzee. And uh, look, and, and the thing is, when you interact with the public, as long as I've been doing it, yeah, uh, there are going to be a lot of people that just really don't like me. Right? Uh, it's, it, it's part and parcel of the way it works. Way You're just, yeah, I mean, look, I always say this. If Mother Teresa was on social media, she would have haters. There'd be people <laughs> saying, that Mother Teresa, she only feeds the, po the poor for the clicks, right? That's what would, that's what would happen. Exactly. So it's really more so, and I think one of the things that helps is because I've always been like at the top, I've never had like a boss that could fire me. Okay. So it makes it much easier to just be myself. Okay. Right? Fair and enough. I think that it's so hard today for people to be themselves because of how critical the whole landscape of public interaction is now with social media. And look, for some people, that rubs them the wrong way. But for other people, they kind of find it a little bit refreshing that there is actually somebody that when they watch him in an interview or they see and listen to him on a podcast and then they meet him in person, they're like, wow, it's actually the same person. Yeah. Because that's so unusual that it's normally like this part of what they do is this part of what they do. And then they're not the same in person. So okay. I'm the same douchebag in person as I am on camera. It's no different. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, it, do, it doesn't it doesn't get any better, and it doesn't get it. Well, maybe it gets a little worse. I say some really stupid shit in person. Well, maybe yeah. that's why everybody yeah. loves to follow you because they want to wait and see what you got to say next, huh? Oh, it get me canceled, get me kicked <laughs> off. All right, well, let me go ahead and ask you a last question before we start the event with you tonight. Yeah, Saka Squatch. Yeah, how did that become? So it's like all nicknames, man. Yeah, you'd love to be able to give yourself your own nicknames, but you can't. So the nickname Saka Squatch, when I worked at JR, I had a corporate apartment, but I was unwilling to live in Jersey because they have stupid taxes and stupid gun laws. Are you listening to me, New Jersey? Really terrible gun laws, really terrible taxes. So I would, basically I kept my residency in New Hampshire. Okay. Because um, I didn't have to go to the corporate offices that often because I was also the guy traveling to Central America following all our products and brands and whatnot. Um, one day I got my truck to drive back to New Hampshire and I realized I forgot cigars, okay. so I whipped out my phone, found the nearest cigar store that was on my way heading north with the intent of going in there and buying four or five cigars, that enough to get me through my truck. I can't drive if I'm not smoking. It's like a seat, oh, yeah. right? Gotcha. So I pull in, I walk to the cigar store with the intent to buy a few smokes, and the owner looks up and he goes, my God, it's Steve Saka in my cigar store. It's like seeing a Sasquatch. <laughs> and um, so I hung out in the store, smoked the Robusto and then it just once a month or so I'd make a habit of just stopping at the store on my way north yeah. and hang out with his regulars and smoke a cigar and shoot the shit and uh, they just started calling me Saka Squatch and that's when the, and that's, where that, that's where that nickname came from ah, yeah. uh, the, the model thing didn't come for good god 20 25 years into the future, yeah, right? The little statue, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, so, but yeah, it's the same thing, you know, Saka Khan's a nickname I got while the Navy, Papa Saka's a nickname, it's what the young girls, the younger workers, uh, female ones would call me in the factory, okay. what my grandkids call me. Okay. We have other nicknames, but like Shithead's not a good name for a cigar, yeah. so probably not gonna use that one. And some fans yeah. probably can't use it, I guess, yeah. I would say. So, but, but I have a, to each his own. I have one more nickname in my back pocket. I don't know when I'm gonna use it, but- uh, kind of on hold? Yeah, look, you can only do so much, right? Gotcha, uh, gotcha. Uh, yeah. All right, well, we'll wrap it up, but what's in the future for Dunbarton as you're going forward? Dude, I am so busy worried about next Tuesday. The future is like, that, 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 that whole thing when someone says to you, what's your five-year plan, what's your 10-year plan? I barely have a, I mean, cigar-wise, I have a plan because I have no choice. Yeah, but you but, can't disclose but, 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 everything. But business-wise, I have no clue. Gotcha. I mean, you just, I'm just rolling with the punches. Just go with them. <laughs> well, Steve, I want to thank you for giving yeah, me the yeah. time on Smoking the Base Cigar yeah. Review, sir. Thank My you pleasure, very much. Man. Everybody, get down to Ohlone Cigars. If you're going to miss the event, we will have plenty of cigars and probably continue through the weekend and next week into the week to continue having Dunbarton I hope, cigars. I hope you sell all this shit out. Yeah. Get it out of the door. Screw <laughs> it. Let's sell it out today. Once again, Steve, thank you for joining me, my man. Get down to Ohlone Cigar Lounge.
and join us. Thank you. Peace.